Chapter 5 Gifts The ship's crew never mentioned the storm, thinking it was a freakish storm that often happens with the devices the Abenians have in place to keep the earth from erupting into a ball of fire. It is now five hours later, and the horseshoe is in open waters traveling along the outskirts of the Florida coast. Jotame steers the ship left, passing the remnants of the keys, which were weathered away by many hurricanes over the last century. From there, the horseshoe finds its way up the eastern coast. Its destination? The city of Crypto, New York. The former slaves and a Buxigan and Dumb wait patiently next to the twins as they can't believe what happened, keeping watch as ordered by Mletsi. Akutukananu awakens on the floor next to a very concerned sister. She notices her wounds are healed. Anu! Are you okay? A Akunsimbel says tearfully. I am. Who? Who are all of you? Akutukanana asks. She has forgotten about her friends and family for a moment. I am your sister, Akunsimbel. You went to visit the gods. I thought they were going to take you from me. Tears flow down a Kunsimbel's face. No. Akutukanana proclaims there is but one god. Like Abuxigan has said, and he has given us these powers to destroy our enemies and free ourselves from captivity. A Kunsimbel is confused by what her sister says. What? One god? Akutukanana nods. One god. He's healed us, sister. Observe your wounds. You are also healed. A Akunsimbel steps away and observes herself. She is healed. A Akunsimbel rejoices. God be praised. There's no more pain. She quickly hugs her sister. Let's get you ladies clothed properly and leave these slave quarters. I'll be all too happy to slaughter our enemies. Alda says with exuberance and everyone agrees and cheers. Searching throughout the ship, they discovered weapons on board the vessel and dung in Abuxigan backpacks. Abuxigan smiled as he tells the twins, I'm so grateful for Sabaoth showing us the path. Then he turns to the men saying, I'll show you how to be warriors for Sabaoth. Akela Malek, keeper of the scrolls of indigenous wisdom, said it best. Black sons of Africa. Eu melanated princes of San Giariel. The royal blood is created from the dark energy of space that forms the dark matter that fuels life. The liquid currency you carry in your loins was meant to be deposited in the womb matrix vault of a woman of equally royal status. Royal is Ariel or light of El or God. That light is what you carry inside you. The vault or womb bank is the only vault that can turn black liquid currency into solid black gold expressed in the world as your true wealth. To the anger of many fallen angels, Elohim gave you the gift of immortality through the recreation of yourself indefinitely. What are you doing with that gift? How are you spending that wealth? With what bank of life? Abuxigan held up his weapon as he continued. We are those in whom he spoke about the melanated people of the earth, the chosen people of Sabbath. They have used, abused, manipulated, and molested our bodies and minds to control us. No more. Attack. Old One guided them through the vessel as they rushed to the entrance to the deck, and a guard stood there when he noticed the men. Abuxigan and the former slaves rushed the ship with fury. A guard notices them and screams. The slaves are revolting. Abuxigan quickly grabs Dung with both hands and spins him towards the guard as Dung transforms into a hammer. The slaves are. The guard's brain matter flies everywhere, and the body falls to the floor. Dung suddenly transforms again, forming a sword as Abuxigan forces it through another nearby Anakata's heart. The sailor's body falls off the ship's bow into shark-infested waters. The sword quivers as Abuxigan places the blade on the ground. It shapes shifts back to a humanoid blood-covered dung. Dung looks at the carnage as he shouts. We are winning. While out of breath. Abuxigan says. We have only just begun. He looks to his left and sees the sisters Akunsimbel and Akutukananu fighting together without mercy. Victimized and brutalized, either have any pity for their enemies. Akunsimbel, being the most abused, 
has a founded hatred engraved into her bones. She lets loose an unfathomable screech such as never been heard in living history, which sends a reverberation throughout the ocean. The waters are disturbed. Thunder rolls and lightning crackles. The sea began to swell, and a sixty-foot tsunami arose quickly from it and smashed headlong onto the ship's starboard bow, washing away all who stood in its path. Dung immediately becomes a tightly knitted rope-like net and covers a buxigan while latching onto a drill hook on the ship's hull. Heavy rain comes from this massive storm and pummels the horseshoe. The wind, rain, and dark clouds made it nearly impossible to see anything. Akatukanana speaks in an ancient tongue while looking toward the heavens with her arms outstretched. A buxigan yells and reminds her, Anu! Don't forget we are on here too! She takes heed and creates a wind vortex around her allies. The gigantic wave smashes back into the ship. A loud cracking sound followed. After the wave destroys the left starboard bow, leaving it in tatters, Jatame somehow holds onto the rope tied to a broken mast. But he does not make it past Akatukanana's gaze. She stretches forth her left hand in Jatame's direction. A bolt of lightning strikes and kills Jatame on the spot. Thunder booms and shakes the ship even while in open water. While the twins practically drown all those who are foes. Alda incinerates Tananakatas with his new gift. Seraph! Horrid screams followed soon after that. The smell of burning flesh hung in the air and filled the nostrils of all. Who remained? As the war rages on, Breg, Jatame's son, watches as Akatukanana murders his father from afar. He hides behind a slightly open hatch for the rest of that evening. Abuxigan and the former slaves revolted against their captors and took control of the ship. Deep inside the vessel's bowels, Breg hides in one of the slave quarters that had not been occupied. It stinks, dark, cold, and wet. Breg is destined to remain there until the horseshoe reaches New York. He only comes up sporadically for food and air as the captives sail the ship east. The captain's first mate, a man named Gonzalez, was captured and bound to a mask, looking at Abuxigan. You black bastard, I will kill you! Abuxigan grabbed the first mate by the neck. Birmingham. Kentucky. Confused, the first mate said, What the fuck are you talking about, you black bastard? Abuxigan said, Ku Klux Klan. White caps, night riders is what I'm talking about. How often have people like you murdered, raped, robbed, and stolen from us because of your uncontrollable lust for land, power, and greed? Willie McCoy, Nathaniel Pickett too, Prince Jones, Timothy Thomas, and countless others, and the stories of Birmingham, Kentucky, have plagued my people throughout history. A thriving tobacco town siege by white marauders called night riders raided the black part of the town, shooting and killing black landowners, while the black people lost acres of farmland that they worked for decades for pennies to their executioners. Or Pierce City, Missouri, where a thousand white people killed and burned down black-owned houses within four days as the rest of the black population fled for their safety. They, too, lost farmland acres and sold for pennies on a dollar. The stories go on and on, like Hickman, Kentucky, Holmes County, Mississippi, and Okoe, Florida, with the Okoe Massacre. The first mate got irritated listening to Abuxigan and shouted, Spare me the bullshit leisure and do what you what to do. It has to be better than listening to you go on and on about some nonsense. I was born to rule, and you were born to serve. Play your part and deal with it. Alda became enraged at what the first mate said and plunged a steel rod into the man's mouth. And I'm tired of your mouth and your bullshit. The first mate gags on his blood and dies in excruciating pain moments later. Old One looked at Abuxigan and was taken away by his words. Little man, how? Do you know so much about our people and culture? Abuxigan replied. Where me and Dung are from, we live in peace and harmony with Anacatas, Compiutans, and Wakatilians, and they call us mestizos because of this. My father, ants and uncles rule the land as peacekeepers for Sabaoth. We learn our history together, and are taught unity early. Old One said surprisedly, Never heard of such a place. Dung said, 
You probably have. They used to call it No Man's Land. It is now known as Sabaoth's Land. It consists of Mandanat Altenware to Colonia Anahuac. Laguna. De Bustios, Ciudad Cuatemoc, the twin cities of Colonia Alvaro Obregón and Granius El Venado, all along a great highway called Juan Inyekavu Trail, named after Abuxigan's father. Old one and the rest could not believe what they heard about young Abuxigan, but they knew one thing, this kid was far from average, and their newfound gifts also confused many. Alda asked, Abuxigan, Do you? No. Can you tell me more of these old stories? Abuxigan was happy as he taught, and the men gathered around him. I am not one to hate, and I don't hate anyone except those filled with evil, for there are many people of all nations that are good, just as there were those who are evil, but hatred because of a particular race or creed has always done something to my soul. Speaking of which, I am reminded of Mr. Adam Crosswhite, a Wakatilians. He and his family lived in Marshall, Michigan. Four men from Kentucky came into town to seize him and his family under the Fugitive Slave Law of 1793 to return them to bondage. The men of Marshall were notified of the situation by the auction bell, which was simply a man that rode on horseback ringing a bell with important news or information. Early that morning, he rushed through the town. The slave catchers are after the crosswhites. Neighbors heard the signal and ran to his house. A group of over a hundred community men, both black and white, gathered at his home. They distracted the Kentuckians while Adam, his wife, and their four children escaped by train to Detroit and continued to Canada. These people didn't see color. They saw a man in need and were there to assist their neighbor. Love is colorblind to many, like the parents of the African Roman emperor who influenced Britain in the first century. Lucius Septimius Severus was born into a family of great wealth and leptus magna, now Al comes in. Libya. His mother was of Italian descent, and his father was from North Africa. He was the first emperor born into a regional family of non-Italian origin. His mother's ancestors came from Italy to North Africa. They belonged to the gens Fulvia, originally called Falvia, an Italian aristocratic family that had its origins in Tusculum. His father was a simple country boy with no political status. However, he had two cousins, Publius Septimius Severus and Gaius Septimius Severus, who served as consuls under Emperor Antoninus Pius. Many are ignorant of our accomplishments, like that of Estevanico, from Morocco, who crossed the North American continent for the first time with just a party of four. His expedition discovered Arizona and New Mexico. Estevanico's travels opened up the states southwest of Florida as far as the Pacific Ocean. Abuxigan looked at the men and said, I will stop there for now because I want you to look this information up and read it for yourself like my father used to say. Don't believe any man, for every man is a liar, and only Sabaoth speaks the truth. Alda then said, How can we believe the authors of these books? And Abuxigan said, Good question and walked away with a smile, saying, Now you're thinking? It's been three days since the Horseshoe Massacre, and the former slaves are rejoicing graciously. Old One, however, has been standing on the ship's deck all three days, watching the sunrise and set. Weary and exhausted but continues to stand and admire the sun setting and rising. Alda was baffled by this and wondered if Old One was okay. Standing just twenty feet away, watching Old One watching the sea and the sun. Abuxigan takes notice of Old One and Alda standing at a mast. Abuxigan walks up behind Alda. Alda? Abuxigan calls out to him quietly. Alda looks over his shoulder slightly to see Abuxigan. Old One, he's been standing in the same position for the last three days. Freedom must feel strange. Abuxigan replies. You would too, maybe if you were held in chains all your life. Alda stands silently for over two minutes. It's a lot to take in for someone such as Old One. I assume he is taking it one day at a time. Like many of us are. Abuxigan agrees. Indeed, Alda, from bondage to freedom so quickly. How would any man? Respond? The ship creaks and groans. From afar, 
the wind carries the celebration of the free slaves. Behind the two warriors, you can see one large torch attached to a scone hanging off one of the remaining masts. The people dance and sing underneath it. Abuxigan hears the festivities behind him and admonishes Alda to leave Old One in peace. Leave him alone, Alda. He will come around. Abuxigan walks away. Alda soon follows. Later that night, Abuxigan checks on the twins. Both are in a room alone, meditating and praying. Abuxigan knocks on the door. But there is no response. Anu and Akan, it's me, Abuxigan. Still no response. Concerned, Abuxigan pushes the door open. The room is filled with fog, mist, and an eerie feeling. As Abuxigan walks further into the room, Abuxigan sees a Kunsan Bell kneeling and crying. When he looks up to see why a Kunsan Bell is bowing, a large white humanoid cloud reaches down to comfort a Kunsan Bell while simultaneously looking at Abuxigan. Its eyes were like fire. Abuxigan excuses himself and closes the door. A Kunsan Bell. Let's see calls a Kun by her name. My lord, forgive me. I did not believe my sister. She please. You are forgiven. There is a great war ahead. Satan and his armies are spreading death and destruction across the face of the earth. He will be stopped. We chose the two of you from birth to do the Lord's will. Let's see states. Akutukanana nervously says, My lord, this is why we have these gifts? Are we chosen? Even. Let's see cuts Akutukanana off. Yes. There will come a time when your faith will be tested, Akutukananu. Because of your uncertainty now, you will face adversity but put your faith in the Most High. It must not waver. Letsi vanishes, and the mist dissipates. The two sisters dressed alike. In white silk dresses with a golden belt wrapped around the waist and barefooted. The room the twins now occupied belongs to a high-ranking commander. It is very spacious. The walls are bare, but the flood is covered in various animal skin. Why did you doubt Anu? A Kunsimbel asks her sister. I do not know. I just, a familiar voice speaks to Akatukananu in her mind. I told you, you are mine. Mind, body, and soul. The creature from Akatukananu's storm vision reminds her of what it said to her as it cackles quietly and fades away. Akatukananu jumps up in fear as she looks around the room to see where the voice came from. A Kunsimbel stands to her feet, eyes glowing a hot white bluish hue. Akatukanana turns back to her sister to see her in warm mode. What is it, Anu? A Kunsimbel demands. I sense something evil around you. A Kunsimbel says angrily. I do not know a Kun. It's the enemy. Maybe that's what the Holy One. A Kunsan Bell interjects. Maybe? You cannot lie to me, sister, for we are one and know each other moods and thoughts. I see it's something that I cannot help you with. It is something only you can deal with. A Kunsan Bell's eyes return to their original brown color. A little more relaxed. She gently grabs her sister's hands. We can do this together even if I cannot directly help you. I will be there for you to help fight this enemy. She shows her sister a compassionate look. Thanks, sis, Akatukanana says. They hug each other. I'm scared, Akun. I cannot see this foe. Akun Simbel. Looks her sister in her eyes. Hey, that doesn't matter. Did you not hear our teacher? We are chosen. No matter the enemy, as long as God is with us. We will win. Who can stand against us if God is for us? No one. Always keep that in mind. Akatukanana nods in reply. A Akunsimbel pulls away from their embrace. Now let us meditate and pray, little sister. Akatukanana agrees. Yes. We shall pray and gather our strength. They both meditate and pray into the night. After three hours, a mist arises and sets on the twins. A surge of power charges through them. Behold, I give you power over all the power of your enemies. Letsi proclaims. But the power of God doesn't just fall on the twins. It touches everyone on the horseshoe. 
Alda sits on the deck, watching the ocean toss back and forth. A voice calls to Alda. He looks around in confusion and dismisses the sound. The voice calls to Alda again, but this time from the ocean. Alda. Alda gets up and squints his eyes. It appears to be a person. Walking on the sea. Taken aback, Alda is not sure of what he sees. Alda. He hears the voice much closer as if someone is standing next to him. Who are you? Alda yells back. Alda's name echoes within his ears. Alda grabs them both and yells back. Leave me alone! Letsy is standing behind him. Alda is struck with amazement and fear as soon as he turns around. He drops to his knees in total shock at the presence of the Ancient One, from thine lips a sword comes. To sever the truth from the lie and deliver the one most high justice. Letsy took a lump of coal. Lit with holy fire and touched Alda's lips. The spirit of God enters Alda's soul. He rejoices and praises God's name for it. Letsy moves quickly to La Rouge, who is walking the ship's halls. Letsy appears before La Rouge suddenly, which nearly scares the man to death. La Rouge jumps and runs for dear life. As La Rouge reaches the end of the hall leading to the ship's deck, Letsy appears before La Rouge again. La Rouge halts in his tracks immediately. Letsy touches La Rouge's heart precisely as he comes to an abrupt stop which La Rouge nearly falls forward trying to stop, but the touch quickly calms the man. La Rouge, shocked at the holy being that stands before him, La Rouge asks, Who, what? Are you? Letsy smiles. I am your brother in the Lord. Fear not. I come to deliver to you a word of power from on high. Shake the earth wherever you walk, out of the evil that encompasses it. You will administer justice on the spot, and it shall not be lenient. Go, and do the bidding of the Lord. A surge of power enters La Rouge's heart and spreads throughout his body. He gapes and falls to his knees in shock after realizing he was blessed with a gift from the One Most High. La Rouge begins to praise God for the blessing he received. Letsy leaves La Rouge and Alda after speaking to each with words of power and encouragement. He searches for the last one, the telepath. Old One is standing in the same spot on the ship that Alda discovered him on hours before, watching the moon and the waves of the oceans. He senses the presence of the Lord and instinctively knows which of the Trinity is upon him. Letsy, what news do you bring from the King of Glory? Letsy replies, Your word has not changed, telepath nor has your rebellion against the One Most High. Old One huffs and then snarks. My rebellion? Letsy says sharply. Weigh your words wisely, Old One, for they will be your last. Old One arrogantly asserts himself. He turns around quickly, although he stumbles at first from standing at the bow for three days. His tattered clothes blow in the wind. Lightning flashes across the midnight sky again expressing Mletsi distaste for Old One's rebellion. My last Mletsi? Old One shouts while facing Mletsi. The Spirit of Grace. Mletsi is glowing dangerously. There is a white glow that accompanies and surrounds Mletsi. The Spirit of Grace measures Old One's words while weighing the intentions of his heart. The glory pulsates in rhythm with Old One's heartbeat. The standoff is cold, and it starts to rain. Old One's heart beats loudly for the entire confrontation. His anger intensifies, and his heart rate increases, as does the pulsation of the glory that covers Mletsi. My last words were to my daughter as you stood by and let the Anakatas slaughter her. I called for help from the King of Glory. Lightning crackles across the sky. But what did I get, Mletsi? Nothing but slaughtered people and a murdered family. Enslavement is what I got as my reward, Mletsi. Old One then bellows. My name is Ashoga, and I bow to no one. Thunderclaps and rock the ship as these words leave Old One's lips. A bolt of lightning strikes a mast causing it to catch fire. The flame brings just enough light to show both parties' silhouettes in the dark. Ashoga, presently called Old One, seethes with fury. Mletsi is covered in clouds surrounding its being 
still measuring old one's words while the glory of the Lord is pulsating in sync with old one's heart. Heavy breathing comes from Old one, since you have chosen rebellion, you are accursed further. Condemned to walk this mortal plane for one hundred years more. You are forbidden to die until these years are completed. And let's see vanishes. Tears fall from old one's eyes. Grieved to his heart, he cries out to God angrily. Ah! I hate you! I hate you! Every one of you! He falls to his knees in uncurable grief. The sound of lightning and thunder can be heard and seen throughout the ship. Old One falls as his face lies on the deck, grieving tremendously. For it has been over one hundred years ago now. Ashoga, now known as Old One, lost his family and tribe to the Anakata's war. He was once a powerful and prosperous king that has now been reduced to a bitter old man. During that time, Letsi was sent to recruit Ashoga to fight for the army of Yahweh Sabaoth. Because he was a great king and a skilled man of war, Ashoga was arrogant. He told Mletsi then that he was a shoga and bowed to no one. Sensing the arrogance in the king's heart, Mletsi cursed him on the spot, and calamity befell the rebellious king for disrespecting the spirit of grace. Sabaoth wanted to end his life, as did the spirit of grace. Mletsi. But Mshika showed the fallen king mercy as it was clear everything that the king held dear would be destroyed in a blink of an eye. This would crush the king's pride and grieve him for an eternity. Ashoga called out to the One Most High while battling the Anakadas in the Great War. But heaven would not answer, and Ashoga had to watch his daughter and wife be raped and slaughtered before his eyes. It broke Ashoga to his soul. He would fight no more and never speak his name again for a hundred years. He became submissive to slavery and servitude, hoping it would end his life. But unfortunately, the curse that was decreed upon Ashoga was longevity. Cursed to live for one hundred additional years. Kush sat there listening to Big Ma tell her story and saw her lying tugging in the water. Big Ma! She didn't hear him at first, so she continued, so Kush said. Big Ma! You have something playing with your line. You are about to lose it. Big Ma saw the line as she yanked it and started reeling it in. Child, it's a big one. Kush began to help her, and before they knew it, the fish popped out of the water. It's a monster! Look at the size of that catfish! shouted Kush. Big Ma said, Yeah, it's a big N. They finally reeled the fish into the hovercraft, and it started flopping all over the hovercraft. Put that big boy in one of those coolers before it flops his butt back into the water. They sat there talking about the fish before heading back home. They inspected, gutted, and cleaned the fish. Big Ma fried up some potatoes while Kush poured some of Big Ma's favorite homemade hot sauce into some saucers for each of them. As they ate, Kush said, I know a lot about Akila Malik, but did Friedrich have any recordings? Big Ma said, well, Akila Malik was very popular with us, and we didn't even know about him until the people of Arizona came. Here, but sure, we have a few. She said to the AI. Billy, play something from Friedrich while we eat. Billy said, sure. After a few seconds. Today reflects on how a man or woman's word, vow, oath, doesn't mean much in a world that sees lying and breaking a vow or word as okay. It wasn't always that way, however. In ancient times, a man's word could be given as a bond in place of money, land, or title to something of value, as a guarantee of payment for a debt owed. A man's word was compared to God's word in value, as men were the only creature capable of intelligent speech. A gift from the Creator distinguished him from the animals he was given authority over. Because of the sacredness of a man's word which was more valuable to him than gold, men were taught not to give their word casually. A man's word, given as a bond or oath, was an extension of him and said to be tied to his body, soul, and spirit. Everything he owned of value was bound to that word in value. And depending on the context and spirit in which he gave it, it was legally, morally, and sometimes spiritually binding. Legally, it was known as a verbal contract. 
They sometimes brought these to court before a magistrate. When a man said, I give you my word, it meant he was contracting a part of himself in place of money or any other securities, and he could reclaim rights to that word only if he settled the debt. The person he owed usually said, I release you from your oath. It's how divorces were often settled. If he failed to keep his word, the verbal contractor owed either some part of his physical being as labor or his material possessions to pay the debt or obligation owed. Sometimes those who were into the occult or witchcraft, or so-called dark magic, would give their word as an oath with their soul, tied to it as bond for some favor. This would bind them to evil spirits, or worshippers of said spirits, for a lifetime, or until the oath was taken back or broken. Blood oaths were disastrous as this word of a man sealed in his blood meant he offered his future generations as backing for the bond of his word, or it bound the people taking it in blood. Sometimes it was done to bind men as blood brothers generationally. The bad oaths were the source of so-called generational curses that we hear about today. Men gave their word as a bond against their offspring's freedom and lives, and as a result, they bound their descendants to the debt. If unpaid, it was said to be collected through misery and misfortune until the curse was lifted or the debt settled somehow. In the spiritual realm, if a man swore an oath, gave his word as bond or in promise or a vow to God or in God's name, he was held to that bond. If he broke it, it would affect his ability to prosper or be blessed if he did not make good his word. A person to whom he gave his word could go before God and hold his word as bond against his prosperity because he didn't honor the word contract. Some oaths were made indirectly but held to be binding by God. If a man took the life of an innocent person and spilled innocent blood, for instance, they considered it a debt owed to God and the earth and the man's future generations. The blood of your brother cries out to me for justice. God told Cain when he killed Abel, his brother, an indirect blood oath became a curse on Cain's future generations. Enslaved black people demanded reparations from whites who owed a blood debt to their generations. That debt has yet to be settled. Therefore, the scriptures say, It is better never to make a vow than to make one and break it. Because eventually the debt comes due and will be collected, sometimes in blood when it was made in blood. Kush and Big Ma listened to Friedrich for a while before they went outside and sat on the porch drinking lemonade and listening to the night air. Kush was quiet for a bite when he asked, Big Ma, so what happened to the old one, Abuxigan, and M? Big Ma looked at Abuxigan, saying, There were two hundred slaves on that ship. Mletzi appeared to them near Norfolk, Virginia, right before sunrise with the guardian of guardians, Yael, and thirty-one other still-faced beings, saying, Fear not, I am as you say, the ancient Ferigi. You may call me Mletzi. We are here. Sent by Sabbath, and these are your guardian angels to assist those headed north. Nshika has found favor in you, and you were called to do great work in him. The guardian of guardians and these celestial beings are here to do just that. The people looked around in confusion. Mletzi continued, You being human, can only see the guardian of guardians and your guardian angel. If you only see the guardian of guardians, you will not go north but stay and do the will of Sabaoth as instructed. However, those who have not been chosen to continue with Abuxigan are not less. Important. Your work must be done for a season, and then you all will meet again, and then make your way to Georgia. Some will remain in Louisiana, but the rest will go to Arizona for a mighty battle for Sabaoth. All must dock at sunrise and learn your gifts when the time comes to return to the ship. The rest will venture off together, for your work is needed elsewhere. Stay there until true enlightenment has been reached. Until that time comes, know you all are chosen warriors for Sabaoth. Abuxigan and Dung shall guide and lead you to the ways of Sabaoth. You all come from different walks of life but serve the same Sabaoth. These are the orders of the Most High. We have given each of you a charge to keep. The Abenians are destroying all life in their path and must be stopped. As you embark on this voyage to New York, you will collectively face hardships and overcome them, so prepare yourselves. 
Let's see turns toward a books again. You have a separate task that will be revealed to you upon arrival. A particular assignment is destined for you. Stand with. Courage even when you have nothing. Go now and lay waste to the camps of the enemy. Bless the name of the Lord. Let's see walks over to Akatu Kananu. Gifts are given without repentance, but you do not know how to use them. But after you return to this ship, you shall know your gifts and how to use them, at their full capacity. Let's see healed the wounds of those present as he said to them. Now, the rest shall be enlightened and shown the way by your guardian. The guardian stood by their pupils and touched them as they praised Sabaoth. Abuksigan and Dung trained them. Learned to work together as a team, and the rest went around preaching Sabaoth's grace like the disciples in the book of Acts. Unaware of what happened in Arizona, these people boldly did as commanded. They could not even imagine what was about to happen. Let's see visited each of them to bestow the one most high power upon them. After six months, the selected few returned to the ship, and they called themselves the Dirty Thirty. Now how will we get to New York? Larouge asked. Abuksigan looked at Old One. You spoke once before about how the men should be ashamed that a kid got them free. But how can you travel this ship all these years and not know how to steer it? Without humility, we cannot make it in this world. Now Sabbath is with us, so get the driving, steering, or whatever you call it, and get us to the city of Crypto. Old One, still angry with Sabaoth and Letsy for his accursed state, but something about this young man made him understand that his way would only get him another. Hundred years, as he said. I will steer the ship there. Given special privileges to direct this vessel many times before by the captain. So I know how to operate it. We will have to dock at Liberty Island and play our roles. Agata asks, Are we just walking in there free? There is also the question of how will we explain a ship without a captain. Everyone looks around, but none can figure out how to explain the captain's absence. A young woman by the name Debra speaks up. I can morph like dung but into humans only, where he can only morph into objects. The Holy One Who Left gave me the gift and told me in due time that I will be needed for many vital missions. Old One eyes Debra curiously. So be it, Alda says. It is settled then. Change the direction of this vessel and set sail for Liberty Island. Do we all agree? They all agreed. The new warriors for Sabaoth sailed to Liberty Island not without first finding Brett, who had starved to death on the ship. Debra's shape shifted into Captain Jatane when the ship docked after five days along the east coast. The horseshoe finally docks at Liberty Island. Alda, Abuksigan, the twins, La Rouge, and the others are led in chain out of the ship with what appears to be Captain Jatane leading the group and Old One walking next to him. Are we sure this is going to work, Old One? Debra nervously whispers as they walk past a large group of Anakata's guards and slavers. Old One reaches into Debra's mind as she looks aimlessly around. The captain has lived here all his life. Do not give us away, young one, with your suspicion. Yes, I am speaking to you through your mind. Stop looking around. Eyes forward, and take the twist out of your rear, for God's sake. Straighten up and walk like a man. Debra sighed, irritated, but she continued to the island's main entrance, where they met the sergeant general of the Anacatus, who allowed them entry to the island. They all walked with their heads held down as they entered the corridor instructed by Old One. A man approaches. By the looks of things, you're not doing so well lately. I guess you're losing your edge, Captain Jatame. Being guided by Old One, Debra tells the man. Not only am I losing my edge, but this was also my last trip, and I guess I'll keep these for myself. Let me know if you know anyone who wants to buy my ship, and even my sons are not interested in this line of work. Smiling, the man said to Debra, disguised as Captain Jatame. Look like you got yourself a good stock. She replied. Yes, sir, I got a decent stock from my last time. Strong young bucks. And childbearing age heifers. His face turns profound, saying, Oh, by the way, you've been gone so long, you know you haven't heard the news, 
but many of the Abenians and Compiutans have moved off-world. There was some trouble in Arizona that even spooked the Abenians. It just might be a good decision with so many of them off-world. But don't let me keep you. I know you are tired now and just want to go home and get some R&R. Debra smiled. Yes, I'll catch up on the news when I get home. The man smiled. Ten minus one. Debra repeated what the man said. Ten minus one. As they walked away, the man said, Where's that old fool, Tomas? Debra said off the top of her head. I left that fool in the Isles of California chasing hoes. And I don't want to see that asshole another day of my life. He stiffed me out of the rest of my stock. The man laughed. I told your ass before you left. Anyways, see ya. Debra waved and continued on her way. 